I'm speaking to you here from Iceland. Um, welcome to Making Expedition Destinations Stronger Than Ever. Uh, this session is sponsored by Arctic Cruise Ports. My name is Liz Gammon and I will be moderating today's session. First, a few housekeeping notes. I want to let you know that we are recording today's webinar and a link will be sent to you tomorrow. If you're having difficulty hearing us today and are listening through your computer, please check that your speaker volume is turned up or message us using the chat box located on the right side of your screen. Feel free to ask questions through the same chat box or the Q&A section. We will review throughout the presentation and have designated time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar. And now I would like to introduce our panel. Uh, I'm going to start from the left over. This is Dimitris Bekos joining us here, National Manager at Greece, Intercruises, Shoreside and Port Services. We have Eva Britt Kornfeldt, Cruise Manager from Visit Oslo and Visit Svalbard. And Veronica Baldasso, Palacios, owner and manager, Sealand Ship Agents and Suppliers, and executive manager at Delva Agents LLC. Back to our panel. Uh, we joked about it a little earlier, Dimitris. <laughs> we said you were our <laughs> rose between the thorns here. If you'd like to tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and your involvement, please. Hello, everyone. Um, as you know, my name is Dimitri. I've been working in the cruise industry since 1994. I started in operations, I've um, done product development, I've done commercial, and I lead the Intercruise team in Greece uh, since 2012. Thank you. Thanks. Eva Britt, tell us about yourself. Hello. Uh, hello from Oslo. Um, after four years in Svalbard, I uh, moved back to Oslo, and uh, uh, I'm still working with uh, the uh, cruise uh, segment in Visit Os uh, Svalbard and for the Port of Longyearbyen, but on a 100% cruise activity here in Oslo together with the Port of Oslo. So there is a mixture of uh, conventional cruising and uh, expedition cruising, and uh, it's perfect to be working with the two ports, best ports ever in the world. <laughs> Veronica, could you tell us a little about, about, about yourself too, please? You're based in Seattle, okay. so come on. Let's, yeah, let's hi everyone, and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, my name is Veronica, and as Liz said, um, I'm a owner at Sealand Ship Agents and Suppliers in the Port of Bichon, Argentina, and Executive Manager for Delta Agents in the U.S., where we have an office base in Seattle. Uh, we went in this industry for uh, 20 over 20 years. And uh, we attend all exhibition cruise ship operators going down to Antarctica and assist in logistics worldwide for exhibition tour operators and exhibition cruise companies. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Expedition cruising is without doubt the fastest growing sector of the cruise industry. More than 39 new ice class expedition vessels are set to enter the market within the next three years majority of these vessels will carry less than 300 passengers and range in size from 5,590 GRT to an incredible 30,000 GRT. And at the time of writing, it's estimated that there are currently around 57 expedition vessels in operation, sailing predominantly in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. Now, if we add on the anticipated order book numbers, this brings the total number up to 96. Whoa. Not only is this an exciting prediction, but there are those that might argue that such unprecedented growth might add a rather unhealthy burden to what some might describe as an already crowded arena, noting that tourist vessels are but one of several contributing factors, okay? Another factor to consider is that climate change has now ensured the northwest and northeast passages are even more open to navigation in the Arctic summer month. Hence the need for more destinations and ports outside of the polar regions to become actively involved in showcasing what they have to offer this growing sector. And so that is where basically we kick off. The fact that we have a, a sector of the cruise industry that is about to experience enormous growth. And I believe that Everybody who's involved in this has enormous responsibility at this time, of course, to make sure that it, we don't uh, blow it, as it were. Um, now, 
with regards to getting excited about this, because I think everybody should, I think it's been something that perhaps in the past people have thought, well, you know, I'm not in the north, I'm not in the south, there's nothing for me to, to see or do here in any of this, au contraire, as they would say. Because if we look to Silver Sea expeditions and what they have on the agenda for the future with that fantastic um, expedition world cruise, that tells us that things are opening up. I mean, 30, what was it? Hang on, I've got it written down here. 30 countries, 10 routes, 167 days, Ushuaia, Argentina, that's your neck of the woods there, Veronica, all the way up to Tromso in Norway, Everbrit, you'll be there waiting to welcome them all. And of course, they have even calls uh, with you guys over in Greece included. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a heck of a voyage and a lot, I believe, of opportunities for everybody. So now it's, as we see, making expedition destinations stronger than ever. I am, that's kind of um, a, a good punchline there in that what is an expedition destination? It's everything from the north to the south and everything in between, really as long as there is something to share. So um, if, if I was to, to, to say, if we, I'm going to start with you, Dimitris, with regards to shore excursions. We've had some questions with shore excursions, how they get in. And again, we, those of us who've watched the expedition sector grow in recent years, have we're, we're aware, we know that what they tend to do or they like to do, it's all about the excitement of the expedition. Uh, they do come with a lot of um, toys or basic kit on board their ships with kayaks and, and, and well, even helicopters today. Uh, they use their own Zodiacs, inflatable rigid boats that, and, and stuff to get ashore. What do you think that this has for people who are in shore excursions themselves, tour operators on the ground? Mm -hmm. Is there a reason to get excited or is it uh, nothing for us to be to be doing here? No, I think there's, uh, we have to strike a balance, you know, you know, when you think of expedition cruising, you know that the, the backbone of all the activities are um, high um, zodiac rides. So for any new destination uh, and local tour operators, it's important to build a, a product portfolio of I'm sure excursions, which include the local communities, because I think it's vital that the local communities are involved in these expedition um, cruises will enhance the experience or give the opportunity to some guests to immerse in the local cultures of uh, these destinations. So I think it's a win-win um, for the local um, tour operators to get involved. Absolutely. And are you seeing that too, Eva Brett, up there in, in the north? <clears throat> yes, I do think so. Uh, uh, for Longyearbyen, it is first and foremost a turnaround call, uh, turnaround port, and uh, the guests fly up to Longyearbyen. Uh, and uh, hopefully they stay a night or two in Longyearbyen before they go on board the vessel. And then they sort of disappear for Longyearbyen and for the community and sail uh, up uh, along the west uh, uh, coastline of Spitsbergen or around this, uh, the full uh, uh, island group. But um, I think uh, one of the challenges and what is also very interesting is to um, be able to see uh, uh, the local community in Longyearbyen and work closely with the community before they go out into the wilderness and uh, do landings uh, on the remote islands and shores. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, of course. Are you finding this too, Veronica, that you, I think you get a lot of turnaround traffic, don't you, down there, especially in Ushuaia, that is the place. Is there a danger of overcrowding in, in, in this? Would you be looking for um, potentially other ports to, to handle turnarounds, so to not to, to, to overburden, if you like, that area? Well, um, the local authorities in Argentina have been working diligently in um, setting up new structures for the ports. Uh, to be able to accommodate more vessels. Uh, um, logistically speaking, it doesn't make sense to go to other ports because Ushuaia is the closest one. It has international airport, it can supply bunker, all supplies can be arranged. So logistically, it's the one that makes the most sense. And it's the yes. one that's uh, set up ready and running uh, since uh, over 30 years now. Yeah, 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 yeah. It needs it needs work, and it's a it's a fact. It needs uh it needs um, work, but um it's only for improvement. 
uh, currently there is a project in place where the government has announced funds to uh, extend the pier, double its size, to also create a, a commercial terminal for passengers and then leave a terminal only for uh, fishing and cargo ships. And terminals and passengers. Yeah. And of course, the situation where we're in now, the uh, the COVID, wow. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm not involved directly with ports, but um, are we going to be seeing, do you think, a lot more uh, expense, if you like, they're going to have to invest in their in their terminals and and in if you're going to be handling any ship, I guess all of us can agree on that. There there is going to be a certain amount of investment involved in preparing for the future seasons, whether it's north or south or in between. <laughs> well, I can only speak for the the port of Ushuaia. Uh, even though we have the, we have the COVID nineteen pandemic right now happening. A couple of months ago, the state government of Cerro Loco has announced that they approved the budget to the, for the uh, peer extension. Uh, so they they do know that the pandemic will go. This will this does this too shall pass, and the ships are going to come back. Uh, tourism is going to be reactivated eventually, and they want to be ready for it. This is a long term investment. And it's not going to be overnight. Uh, it might take them one or two, two years at least. Uh, but they understand that it needs to be done. Yes. If I may well, add for Svalbard that we had started a project uh, last year because there was a tendency that uh, uh, many uh, operators wanted to turn on the same day. So uh, we want to try to spread the traffic better so that there is enough space and buses and guides and the uh, uh, place at the pier for everybody. And that makes such a better experience for the guests, you know, not having multiple ships turning around on the same day. Yes, absolutely. And, and um, well, you're all operating at the moment. You're all in the thick of it. Eva, if I, if I go back to you there for one moment, I mean, you're, you're, as we speak, there are ships sailing, expedition ships. Um, in yeah. your waters up there. This is yeah. fantastic. This is great to see I, it. And I just talked to Kjetil, the port director of Longyearbyen today. Um, I was up there in March and uh, there was one ship called Oribo who thought I'd be there early this year and uh, make the best of the season. And they have been there now since March, but they have had some cruises. Uh, according to the Norwegian legislation when they were allowed to. And also Le Bourial from Pomont is up there. And uh, having had uh, one or two cruises with uh, uh, French guests, but uh, the legislation in Norway is now stricter again. So, uh, but those two ships are, have been up there. So that's, uh, I think that is, uh, will unfortunately conclude the 2019 season. But you've learned a lot. Um, you know that you can share with people and and that's the fact that you guys were basically first off the the starting blocks there and all right with expedition cruising dimitri msc you guys are handling all of that how, how has it gone with all of those things with with regards to investment and and how the ports and the and the in the um yeah the, the turnaround how did it go you know was it was it take longer than well, normal what was really impressive was the uh, the procedures that, had, that MSC had in place. Um, they were very strict um, procedures and tests that molecular tests as well. And they were able to see if, uh, that 50 people turned positive in some tests. So they were denied boarding and the whole cruise turned out to be very successful. It was very positive. We are in uncharted waters, aren't we? We don't yes, we you know we're getting this <laughs> really. I mean, everybody's kind of as we say shooting from the hip but at the same point of course we have to be very careful we're talking about people at the end of the day human beings and lives and, and so on but i must say i'm really impressed how things are moving forward um veronica you, you this hit you guys down south well we were watching it perhaps on the news we we could see that oh hang on a minute well, I'm, you know i'm tasked how is it going there it must have been terribly challenging but at the other hand, now you have had enormous learning experience to prepare for the coming season. So as Eva Britt will say goodbye to her vessels, they come across to you. And 
how are we going to see your season? Do you think is it going to be as good as you expected? Or what 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 do you what do you anticipate? Well, the season for serving is going to be affected uh, because the operators need to make a decision on how much risk are they willing to to run operations under. Um, the experience uh, that we had, well, we we're we're kind of um, lucky in a way because when the pandemic started at the end of February, we were about to complete the season. Seasons, Antarctica seasons uh, run at the Port of Ushuaia from end of October until March every year, every year, every every season. So we were already um, having protocols. We already had protocols in place by February where we were sending our staff with uh, some protection equipment and sanitizing and extremely measures of of uh, to, to make sure that everything was sanitized and, and, and everybody was being kept safe. Uh, but luckily we didn't have any cases on any of, the, uh, on any of our ships in at the Port of Ushuaia. Uh, we have to consider ourselves lucky. We, we took measures to prevent, even before the, um, the World Health Organization uh, announced it as a pandemic. Um, but yes, um, after after what happened, we started working with um, the the local authorities, operators, medical advisors, special, um, specialized uh, people in uh, epidemiologists uh, that were working for us to create protocols to make sure that um, expedition crews operations of the Port of Ushuaia were going to be kept in a safe environment, and making sure that the interaction between the crews ship passengers and uh, the people in town was to be kept under a safe, um, let's say, bubble, if, if you can use the word. But it, it's, very, it's very difficult to talk about bubble in like a globalized world, you know. But um, we were, uh, we we're putting up together um, a lot of um, project programs and also well protocols in place to make sure the operations are run safely. A lot of work. Uh, absolutely. It I mean, it, yeah, actually, it's been it's been harder than other years where it's uh, the season starts in October. We're super busy until March and then you have like some time to do amateurs of work. But right now it's been meetings and conferences and calls with PCR machines and protocols and uh, meetings with the national government and the state government. And it's been it's been very busy. And I'm guessing that we can expect the same all over the world as cruising uh, resumes and picks up speed. We can expect this and we, we can also expect it to be a fluid situation. So perhaps if we were to say then at this point, you've got to be ready for anything, anything and everything and anything in between flexibility. Be able and could it possibly be I'm going to go and try and turn a negative into a positive here. But if one port is unprepared or there's uh, one destination that says no, we're pulling up the drawbridge, um, it, it, you know, we can't accept any calls. Is it worth um, our listeners are uh, here, the people taking part in this, is, is there, a, do you think, an opportunity somewhere? As long as you're there waiting on the sidelines with all your, you know, ticked all your boxes, do you think that ships might do last minute things, especially these smaller ones? Um, What's, what's your opinion on that? Uh, Dimitri, is, is this, do you think, something that might be happening within the Med? I think, I think it's very possible because, we, as you said, the whole situation is very, very fluid and we don't know how the cases will increase per destination, per country. So, you know, what they, we may see that a specific port or destination is a viable um, port and itinerary and then two days later it may not be. So it's definitely an opportunity um, for all local operators and ports to 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 see how this progresses, uh, it's you know we're living in a very uh, dynamic um, situation here where everything changes on daily. You know we see different regulations coming in, different regulations um, uh, regulations are changing. So I see this as a very high possibility. So if we were talking to, we have some, obviously some ports listening into us, be ready, have, have, your, have your stuff listed up, be ready on the sidelines, make sure you've got everything there. 
um, and back to our, our shore excursions, have some things going on, you know, you, you know about a maybe a caving thing. It, I, I'm guessing people are a little more active and they want to it, um, get more into the nature and, and culture of all destinations. Uh, and, and so if, you've got, if, you, if you know of some things close by, if you know that you've got some, some great operators, some, some good suppliers uh, who, who are alongside you to back you up as a port, just be ready, have your paperwork ready and, and you never know, you, you could be called in. Correct. Also to have the safety protocols in place, you know, we're moving in the new direction that we had in the past. Every cruise line, regardless if it's expedition or other type of uh, cruise ships uh, in the cruise industry, safety is by far the most important thing at the moment. Yes, 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 and, and, and spacing. But am I correct in thinking that every cruise line will probably have its own set of rules and regulations, but every destination will have its own rules and regulations. Um, uh, and, and so we, again, the goal, goalposts are moving continuously. I'm going to dive in on, on, on our questions that uh, people had obviously put in ahead of us um, this week. We've already talked about the Antarctic season for this summer, October to March 21. Thank you for already answering that for us, Veronica. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, oh, this was one that I, I found interesting. Do you see an interest for underwater heritage and longer, preferably overnight stays, allowing private viewing of sites? Um, Dimitri, what do you think in, in that sense? For, because it's a tour operator. Yeah, anything that enhances the guest expectations is a positive. You know, the, the guests on board these cruise ships are here for, they're on vacation, so they want feel the experience. So if they can see an underwater uh, location, which is unique, by all means, if the vessel can overnight, it will give them opportunity to meet the local community, have different events with the local community involved. It will help the local economy. Um, so for me, I think it's a, it's a big plus and, and absolutely it'll be great if that, if that happens. Underwater. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm, I'm seeing this and of course we have some, some absolutely fantastic new bills on the, well they're not even new bills, there are some of them operating already with all mm -hmm. sorts of underwater equipment uh, and so on. So I'm sort of just thinking if I was a port and I knew I had a, a wreck down the, you know, just you know, out close to us, um, opportunity there. So, so don't just look at what's above the ground when you're trying to talk to or get the attention mm -hmm. of expedition cruise lines. Have a look what's under the water as well, because they have these uh, these mm -hmm. toys. I'm going to call them toys on board. And so, obviously, what's above and below. So, yes, opportunities there again. Mm -hmm. um, so, let's see what else I've got here. Are the Antarctic summer season 2021 originally announced schedules likely to be postponed? That's on your watch there, Veronica, again. Do you think they'll be postponed? Are we going to see some delays? Well, uh, yes, uh, it might be postponed, uh, even though authorities are doing everything in their reach to, to make it happen because it's also one of the main sources of income for the state of Terra for with the Puerto Rico is placed. Um, <laughs> There are currently some operators that are postponing their protocols uh, for the month of November and December, and they would be starting in January. I'm a great fan of following everything online. I like to see where these vessels are. I sort of sit here. And <laughs> how nerdy is that when you spend your time tracking vessels all over the world? But I find it quite fascinating, actually, to see them when they, you know, as they snake their way up from down south up. So is that an indication? Should we all be looking at these uh, vessel tracking apps to see quite where these vessels are, which will give us an indication of if it's going to kick off in time or not? Um, well, no, that depends because uh, they usually need between two and three months to reposition the ship to make sure mm. they're ready for the Antarctica. So you might see them up there and then they're ready to go down to Antarctica again. So. Yeah, but crew, oh, we're not going to go into that. That's for another day. Another day, and probably Sea Trade Cruise Virtual will be delving into all sorts of more in-depth things about about these uh, situations. This is us just, as I say, shooting the breeze. But Eva Britt, um, you had a, a a great answer down here. You had you had a lot of information to share for people. So with regards to, are there another question? 
uh, that's come in ahead, and that was, uh, are there any new changes designing destinations? Um, what are the initiatives from government to receive passengers in their countries? Well, uh, I can I can just uh, talk for Norway, and we had we tried to open uh, Norway uh, slowly this summer, but uh, had a, uh, uh, we had to tighten up a little bit again. Now we have uh, rather strict uh, rules until the first of November. We hope then that it will uh, loosen up again. Um, but of course, uh, the summer seasons for most sports are over. Um, we, we know that uh, we have to have um, protocols in place, both uh, national, uh, nation, on a national uh, level, but also on a destination level, and also uh, for special regions like the Arctic and the expedition cruise segment. But I think that uh, once we know now that we can prepare and look forward to 2021, uh, we have to look at the product development, see what we have, which we can develop and start uh, marketing it to the cruise lines uh, and uh, show them that we have new uh, experiences uh, in stock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, yes, it's all about innovation and, and how, again, making expeditions stronger than ever. So alongside the health and safety, which of course is first and foremost in all of this, if you're going to make your destination stronger, I suppose you're going to be looking at how you can make it more attractive and um, share some of the, the, the hidden secrets behind it so that even though we, we don't want people to sort of say, oh, gosh, I'm going to say Iceland. I'm not going to I'm not going to, to, to point your finger at another destination. I'm going to put it, Iceland. Um, oh, Iceland. Oh, yes, this is all about the Golden Circle, one of the most famous tours. That, oh, we're only going to see the waterfall and we're going to see the coastline. We're not going to do anything. No, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Whereas perhaps for Iceland, and I know they're doing it, they're concentrating the tour operators here are, are really pushing the boat out and working with the cruise lines. I've seen some great overland um, mm. options going on. But they're going right into the highlands, so we're moving away from the coastline uh, here in Iceland with, with regards to uh, tour, tour experiences and, and land programs. That it's even for destinations that perhaps don't have the polar bears and, on in your case, the penguins, there are so many other things to see. And, and so, as I say, speaking from Iceland's side, I know in, in from what they're doing in making the destination stronger is opening up a little bit more it's it's not only about the, the coastline um port to port uh, tours uh, and of course small groups are on board these expedition vessels so we are kind of already in the in the covid mode if you like in terms of not going with buses with 47 passengers that's another story for another conversation but um Dimitri, are you saying things like that? Do you, do you think that the, the tour operators should be getting excited just be, to dig further no. into the destinations? I absolutely agree that it's a necessity. I believe that every tour operator should always continuously reinvent himself, look at ways of developing new products. Uh, you can't just stick with one specific tour and just say, this is what I offer. You know, the cruise lines want to see variety. They want to see local engagement. They want to see um, green tours. So they didn't want to see overlands, as you said, they want to see everything. So any passenger or guest on board a cruise ship, they want to see and live and taste the destination. And that's expedition, isn't it? It's all about the experience. Exactly. We have, uh, we have uh, had a project in uh, Longyearbyen uh, because, of course, when uh, uh, big ships uh, call and there are lots of people in the city, together with the smaller ships, uh, we, we need to, to be proud and take the role of the host. So in uh, cooperation with the locals in Longyearbyen, two years ago, we made uh, community guidelines. Uh, so we made a set of guidelines. Uh, it was inspired by IECO, the Organization of Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators. And um, uh, we had a very, very good cooperation between, with the locals found a set of uh, like 11 points where at the same time we told the 
tourists, our guests, how to behave in Longyearbyen. And we took pride in telling them a little bit about our little town. Like, for example, it, do, please don't pick flowers. It's prohibited. We, we need to keep them for the, for the fauna in, in Longyearbyen. And uh, all the cruise lines helped us uh, distribute these uh, local guidelines. And that uh, sort of uh, made us a little bit more familiar with our uh, cruise guests. Yes, uh, yeah, well, that makes absolute sense. And uh, obviously, Rorik, you've got um, Ayato down down there in the in the south that that, that takes to, with regards to Ayako does the north and and you guys. But I, I'm presuming they all work together. Everything is yeah. We're actually about. members of both so Ayako and Ayato because we work operators are operating at both like uh, south and and north. So, but yeah, and of course we just. Sorry, Eva, with the, uh, with the uh, long season we have in the Arctic for uh, expedition cruising, the first vessels uh, traditionally come in March when there still is the possibility to do winter activities on snow, like snowmobiling, dog, dog sledding on snow, beautiful photographing, and then it slowly turns, uh, gets into the summer with the summer activities, mm -hmm. and then uh, the season normally lasts until October. When, uh, when the midnight sun, uh, uh, there are beautiful settings and uh, the dark season starts. So the expedition crew segment in, in the Arctic is uh, really more, much more exciting than the conventional, which is focused up to now uh, at the three uh, middle summer months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'm with you on that. We had Northern Lights here last night. And normally mm -hmm. we would have had ships in, so we're <laughs> missing out on that. Uh, oh, Mother Nature delivers. And that's what expedition cruising is all about, isn't it? Mother Nature reigns supreme. And, and as I say, culture and getting people to stay longer. Um, I saw a very, very interesting webinar uh, last week with regards to how long they think it's going to take to actually do a full turnaround and how we might potentially see less calls because of the length of time it's going to take people to get on a ship, embarkation, and then, of course, debark is going to take longer, all this fogging of, 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 and spacing of people and so on. So, again, that could be potentially bringing um, opportunities. If, 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 they, if, if My point is, if people are going to be spending longer in, in each of these destinations, you know, it's, it is going to take longer. And even though, do you honestly think that um, expedition ships, I mean, they, will they be sailing less full or because there are not that many normally on board you know they're about 200 packs maximum normally will this affect them do you think these uh timelines that are going to be tweaked to, to, to take longer or do you think that the, the expedition uh, market will actually slip the net on that one as you say maybe you can answer this one for us uh, veronica with regards to turnarounds and do you think it's going to affect um well expedition? in general uh, actually, and it has to do with the title of this uh, um, webinar, Make the Expedition Destination Stronger Than Ever. Uh, what expedition cruise ships have on flavor is that they are smaller ships. They can be kept in a, in a closer environment and, and, and can be more secure. And the fact that they do turn around in only one port, for example, that's in the case of Ushuaia, where the big ships have over 2,000, 3,000 passengers going to different ports around the world, where it's much more difficult to control where the passengers had been, or the, 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 the tracing in case of cases. So that's like a, a, a big plus that we, need, we should be grateful for. Uh, expedition cruise ships have an advantage over the big ships right now. Um, when it comes to the turnaround, um, that's also one of the things that we're currently working on because because of the protocols that we are going to be implementing, uh, we need to be very wise on how we distribute the, the, how we set up the timeline for when the passengers arrive to Ushuaia, the testing if, the, if it needs to be done, or having the passengers, and we're actually working in one of the things that's called Safe Corridor, that we only heard also probably up north as well, where passengers will be arriving into the city, taking straight to the vessel and then turn around for the disembarking uh, passengers, they will be sent to a place to, to wait for, for the planes to, to be ready and then to take them back home. Um, so that all requires a logistic and making sure that it can be done 
um, during the, the day of the call. Usually uh, ships, when they go to Israel, they arrive around 6 a.m. in the morning, clear at 7, do all their operations during the day, and they depart at 6 p.m. in the afternoon. So we are also adjusting the time to make sure that we can accommodate all those operations within that time frame. This was something, I, Dimitri, that was going on uh, with MSC, wasn't it? You you could, you had to empty your vessel. The, the, the vessel had to be completely empty before the, the, the embarkation, whereas it, before they might have flowed the embark and the debark, now it's yeah. one weight and then the other, correct? Basically, we're entering into a new normality right now, so I think the whole process will take a bit longer. Um, you know, we need to follow the guidelines and the health protocols, uh, and uh, and we're going to have we have to be very very careful in how the whole operation goes. So it will definitely take longer. You know, if you look at um, what Veronica said earlier on, and you know, just the ship stores coming into this into the um, the loading of the vessels, that whole process will take a bit longer as well. So it's going to be it's going to be a new normality for all of us how the whole process will proceed, but. Um, in the past, you know, disembarkation will take, will start normally at seven, finish at nine, ships get cleaned, get ready, uh, the cabins get cleaned and, and the ship gets ready, and then all of a sudden you start embarkation around noon. This may not be the case moving forward. Um, so it, it, I think the process will be um, delayed a bit, and I, timing sync port may be adjusted accordingly. I see huge opportunities for pre post. Uh, in this case, you know, with people coming in, if they if this testing thing is still going on, um, you know, okay, you can do your test, you can stay quarantined, but at the same point, I know, like again, I can only speak for Iceland. There are certain things that you can do remaining in your bubble. We're all in our bubble. Uh, it's so difficult, isn't it, to to to, to work it out? Eva Britt, how's it going in, in this with you guys uh, up there with your terms? Share. Yeah, I, I thought uh, uh, um, we have. Um, we have both regular flights to Longyearbyen and we have uh, charter flights and uh, the legislation is such uh, only regular flights domestic uh, are allowed to Longyearbyen so uh, either it is SAS from Oslo or a Norwegian uh, from, from Oslo, uh, SAS via Tromsø as well. But of course uh, charter flights from uh, from abroad is, is another possibility but uh, and there are advantages and disadvantages because with the regular flights we it gives us uh, theoretically more room to to have the guests in Longyearbyen the day after or the day uh, before the cruise. But with the shorter machine coming in, uh, with uh, coming in with new passengers up and flying down with old passengers, uh, it's uh, logistically that uh, uh, sh should not last uh, very many hours, and that means that uh, we don't have too much time to. Uh, play with the passengers in Longyearbyen either. So there is, uh, there are uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages with, with both. But I think the, the main issue is to spread the, the, the calls, the turnarounds, so that we have one per day or as few as many, per, uh, as few as possible per day so that we have enough uh, uh, buses and guides and uh, hotel rooms for them. That's that's going to be the, the new challenge, I think, for, for everybody as we see those ship calendars filling up with the, the port calls uh, mm. to have to finally turn around and say no. I mean, you know, everybody's been saying yes, 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 we'll deal with it. No, no problem. Bring them in, you know, and this growth that we've all experienced, expedition included. And as we can see with those numbers, it's going, there's going, there's going to be more. We can, we can, you know, we, we need to prepare for this. Mm. But if I was to go back a little bit now and rewind, and I'm going back to, to shoreside experiences, um, again, finding that right balance. Uh, expedition, essentially, I, I've been busy with this, uh, working in this since 2000, I suppose, to show my age here. All right, for the last 20 years, how it used to be was we would book, a, you know, a couple of walking guides. Everybody kind of did their own thing. They were they were quiet uh, and so on. Now this is growing. Um, and especially if I speak again, and I know that this will, it will apply to all of us on the ground, when you see our tour providers, our suppliers, the, the, the people on the ground who've been working so hard, and they are in dire straits, you know, everybody is, 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 is in um, an awful state here with, with 
having lost so much business because of this. Is it not now more than ever that expedition cruise lines need to perhaps, I might phrase, share the love a little bit and get a balance so that perhaps, whereas perhaps before they might have preferred to have done everything independently, use their own zodiacs, that's fair enough. But I think if they were to then perhaps the next day come ashore, use a walking guide. Again, I'm in a perfect world where there's no COVID at this point. But it, it, in order to regrow and, um, as you say, I echo, involve local communities more, do we risk otherwise perhaps um, the expedition cruise lines with people, the local communities who are hurting, saying, what's in it for us? You know, why? And, and, and then you get that feeling of, you know, why, why are they doing this on their own? Personally? <laughs> I think a balance, it's a perfect opportunity for more balance within this um, as we move forward into this new era, the new normal, to make, as you say, with shore excursions. Um, you know, we, we all know there's only so much to go around in terms of, of budgets. Everybody's hurting, cruise lines, suppliers, tour operators, hotels, you name it. And I think if we all link together, and as I say, walking to one day, but let's let's visit that museum. Let's have some homemade cake if if you know circumstances allow. How do you see that? I think that it's thing? more. Uh, I think it's more important than ever uh, to realise that there has to be to be be a share with, between uh, with the with the spending and then the economic impact between the destination and the and the cruise operator. Uh, more than ever, especially now after Corona, where many of the the travel tour operators in uh, on shore are really uh, they they need uh, guests and i think uh, taking a local guide on board for the whole cruise using it as a lecturer telling about the life uh, next to the north pole for my uh, in my example and and know where the wildlife is having colleagues uh, on shore who has been out uh, the day before or the day after. I think the local knowledge is is key to uh, to a more authentic experience. Yes, I yes. I agree. I fully agree. You need mm -hmm. to both, you know, both experiences um, in the expedition cruise. You know, you need to have the local element involved. You know, you may have trained professionals on board the, the expedition cruise vessels, but you need to enhance the experience with locals. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think now this season, um, for us up north, it was, uh, it was difficult. We needed to make sure that, that, that people were safe. But now that things are getting a little bit better and, and protocols, are, 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 you know, everybody's learned so much. Next season, yes, I, I, I balance. It's all about balance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. An opportunity back to our making these destinations stronger than ever. If we work together, if we can have um, a, a balance in all of this, and again, back to our suppliers, anybody that's listening, you know, we want to hear those stories, don't we? We want to hear about grandma who used to carry a radio. This is up north here. Well, they used to have to carry them over the mountains, you know, to get them all charged up and these kind of things. You want to hear about that. And, and authenticity is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Deidre, you made a lovely point when, I can't remember quite where it was here, but... Um, <laughs> Where was it? It was really nice about the exploration thing. This this whole yeah. feeling um, of of exploring and, and discovering, <laughs> and that goes beyond. Um, thing, doesn't it? No, yeah, basically what I said is that um you know when you think of expedition cruising and and the market that you're targeting is people who want to experience what the explorers did centuries ago, you know unique um, cultures, um, and scenery. Uh, exotic animals. All this is the experience that they want um, to see going on these um, cruises. And if you combine that with the local communities where you will learn how the local community exists, lives, the daily lives, go into the families, see how they um, do the schooling, how they, uh, the food that they eat. I think all this is a big plus um, the whole product. And I think, you know, when you look at the tour programs that need to be developed, I think you need to balance these elements in there as well. Absolutely, yes, yes. I'm going back to some some, some of these questions. Oh, look, the time is charging through. But anyway, um, 
We had some uh, questions that came through rather last minute. Um, uh, are face masks mandatory for guests on tour? Now, who's taking tours at the moment? Um, Eva Britt, how's it going up north? Are they uh, masked? We, we uh, luckily, Svalbard uh, has been without any infection throughout uh, these uh, six months, and uh, we want to stay like that. So that's uh, fantastic. Um, but uh, uh, as we haven't had too many, uh, to us, the legislation in Norway now is such that uh, if you go on to a public bus here in Oslo, uh, you are recommended to wear a mask, but it's not compulsory. Uh, if you go on to a place where there are many people, uh, you should, uh, it's recommended, but it's not, uh, uh, so, so it's, it, it changes from day to day. And uh, uh, we haven't had that many, uh, we haven't had any conventional shore excursions in Longyearbyen this year, and a uh, few um, expedition cruises uh, Longyearbyen has had uh, are with few people. Uh, 12 on the Urigu and 50% of the capacity at the um, Uriyal. Uh, so I'm not quite sure if they have uh, used masks, uh, uh, but they, they follow the Norwegian legis legislation, of course. How did it go with MSCs, military masks? Basically, I think it all depends on what uh, each country's legislation is and uh, how the COVID um, cases are increasing per country. Uh, in Greece at the moment, um, masks are required in public areas, um, in shops, in um, uh, museums. So it all depends. Um, as we said earlier, it's a, it's a very fluid situation. And the way the cases, if the cases will spike up, then um, the measures will get more tighter and stricter. So it, flexibility. Yeah. How are you designing new ships and refitting existing ships to ha to safely handle circulation of air in staterooms and public rooms? I don't think any of us here are in a position to be able to answer that, but I would like to say to whoever asked that question that, that um, I really believe that you should take a good look at uh, Sea Trade Cruise Virtual from the 5th and the 8th of October. What kind of improvement on the ship's facilities or arrangements are be expected to be done to prevent the COVID-19 on board? Now. Um, I'm not sure if everybody saw this, but um, in particular, I was very impressed with Sea Dream, uh, the yachts of Sea Dream there. With, with their, they had a little video that came out last week, I think it was. I, I saw it on LinkedIn. So whoever is asking me this question, if you go onto LinkedIn or even Facebook and, and get onto to Sea Dream, they had this video and it was very, very interesting to see how they're fogging, they're doing all these things, the te te temperature testing. It was, it was very reassuring. Um, Eva Britt, they're up with you um, at the moment, Sea Dream. Are you seeing any of these? So just, again, what kind of improvements on the ship's facilities? Have you noticed this? Improvement? I haven't been on board, but we have been on the pier welcoming the Norwegian guests back home to Oslo because we wanted to feel the cruise activity. It's really, really nice to have them there. And uh, I'm so proud and happy that they are uh, successful with these cruises from between Oslo and Bergen and Tromsø visiting Skagen, but with the tight legislation now, they uh, no crew, no guest can go ashore in Skagen. But uh, uh, I haven't been on board, but the passengers look happy, and uh, they are, uh, the ambience amongst the crew who are on the pier is also very good. Good to hear. But I was, as I said, I was very impressed with that video, so whoever's asking this question, see Dream video, and you, you'll see it there. It was, it was great. Um, oh, hang on. How can mass market tour operators successfully pivot to capture and operate programs for expedition ships as they reposition? Now, repositioning, that's down to you. Veronica, you re re do you reposition from your ports down south? Yes, I'm sure you would. But this, the uh, head of the season or the end of your season, you're sending them up to us. But how can mass market tour operators successfully pivot to capture and operate programs I'm not sure how to answer that. Who's going to take that one? Well, I can say something on behalf of the ports. And I think that uh, as, as destinations, both in Oslo and in Longyearbyen, we the only thing we want to boost is the shore excursion program from the cruise line. Uh, it's important that we have participants uh, on the shore excursions. And as I see in uh, the Med now, uh, I think the only one allowed ashore 
are the ones attending uh, one of the ship's shore excursion programs. So I think we as destinations would like to, uh, to boost uh, cruise lines programs. Yes, this has been um, an interesting uh, turn of events with that. Uh, Dimitri, you're handling all of yeah. this. Uh, basically, it's all about product. Product, product, product. You know, have the right product that will entice the cruise line, understand what the cruise line is looking for in your destination, understand what the guests are seeking to see and, in, and uh, experience in the destination. If you get that right mix, um, you'll be able to capitalize on new business. Well, if we're going to, we've got a few minutes now to sort of pull this all together. And, and so with regards to port agents, um, Veronica, Port agents now will be looking to prepare for next season in the hope that there is one and get themselves ready. Um, what would be your sort of checklist, if you like, um, of what the port, the port agents need to be really focusing on ahead of their new seasons? Well, working closely with operators uh, and how to apply protocols, um, even though they apply the board, what the interaction is going to be between their protocol and the protocol of Puerto Rico and the city, making sure the city is aware that um, they're not they're not to be afraid of the tourists or the cruise ships coming into the city that it's safe to to guarantee the safety of uh, the operations of the expedition cruise ships coming into the city and to make sure that everybody's welcoming them. Uh, also, making sure that the staff that's involved in the operations is safe and that we can support both communities, exhibition cruise market, and as well the city with which that they interact with. Good advice there. Um, and what about you, Everbritt? Now, with the, you've just finished your first season with uh, cruise passengers and, and, and turns and everything else. So for other destinations who, who are looking to, to try and get into this market, what, what would you say would, would be the flag they need to be flying in, in, in terms of um, bringing expedition ships. And if they are getting expedition ships already, uh, would you, how would you go about giving your advice for anybody with an upcoming season? Uh, I think that to get to know the cruise operators and uh, understand their, uh, the, the demography of their passengers, their guests, and uh, understand their uh, what they want to see and experience and then of course uh, also i think the cooperation we have in the in the cruise networks like cruise norway cruise baltic cruise europe and the north norwegian cruise network makes us well we, we know our neighbors as well and we can sort of plan for a whole region some big ports and some smaller ports and that gives variation to the to to the cruise line and to the to the to the cruise so I think um, the fact that, uh, like, if it's a small destination, new into the market, get to know your neighbor ports and get to know the, um, the cruise line you want, and then uh, uh, get to know uh, one of the cruise networks in your area, which can yes. give lots of information. Yes, oh, that's that's really good advice. Uh, and for yes, I'm, 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 I, I think that's uh, absolutely um, important. And with regards to shore excursions, we've already talked about balance, Dimitri, and the fact that, yes, uh, Eva Britt says, I echo everybody, more important than ever that we, we actually interact with local communities and mm. try and increase the spend a little more ashore. Everybody's been hurting. The, 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 the more we come out of this, the better. But of course, we need nice new products, don't we? We, we want to have stuff that really appeals to that expedition market. And also being organized in either uh, IECO or IOATO uh, in the south is, I think, key because they have such good knowledge of the area. They, they can share experiences and they have very good guidelines to follow. So they know the areas and can, can give good advice. That's one question that I had. I mean, the IECO and IOATO, they, they concentrate on the poles. What about back to the Silver Sea World uh, Expedition Cruise? What happens to the middle bit, if you like, the, the places who are also in need of, of guidance mm. and direction, where should they go? Will, will we see um, a, another association or maybe a, a joining? What would you give advice to? Uh, who, where should people go if they are in the Med, for example, and they know they have um, an expedition cruise line coming and visiting? 
which of those associations, where should they connect? Well, basically, um, I would say Cruise Europe, they should connect. Um, of course, most of the connect, if you go to the med ports, it's more related to the port infrastructures and the ports themselves. So in regards to shore excursions or that, I think it's uh, they will need more to address the cruise line start a communication with the cruise line, see what uh, products the cruise line's looking for and try to build their own products to entice the cruise lines. Good advice. So so associations like Med Cruise, Cruise Europe, um, get in there as an associate member and, and, and really learn from, from your associates, yeah. fellow fellow members. Exactly. And I find these associations are actually really, really good and, and they do um, they do help a lot. And perhaps now with this um, new focus, this growth that we're about to, to experience, uh, maybe those associations will perhaps put a little bit more focus, if you like, on expedition. I know there's a lot of knowledge. Eva Britt, you're a big part of Cruise Europe up there, and I'm sure, Dimitri, you're a big part of uh, Mez Cruise, where you're based. Veronica, you're obviously in, in the IATO sector and IECO, as you point out. So these associations are really where people who are perhaps listening to this webinar and wondering where they should go. That's an excellent first step, isn't it? And of course, Sea Trade Cruise virtual on the 5th to the 8th of October, where are, we can, of course, interact more with the, um, the cruise lines themselves. I can see my clock is running out here, so I'm going to have to get into my intro, uh, rather my, my outro, uh, and that's basically it. That's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for attending today's webinar, making expedition, expedition destinations stronger than ever. And a special thank you again to our sponsor, Arctic Cruise Ports. And as a reminder, we will be sending a recording of this webinar tomorrow to everyone who registered. Thank you again, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, everybody. Dimitri, Veronica, Eva Britt, and of course, to everybody listening. Thank you all thank so you much. Much.